it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Linda and, and to welcome her back to uh, the Notre Dame campus, a place where she's often visited and uh, where, I suppose it goes without saying, she has many friends and admirers, among whom I include uh, myself. Linda was first, I thought she was first on campus in 1987 when she visited uh, the Center for Philosophy of Religion in its early days, a memorable visit, but she tells me five years before that she gave a paper. I didn't. So th three years before that. Three years. Before. It was the very first time I'd ever given a philosophy paper. Wow. Was what was here. it on? <laughs> foreknowledge and free will. What else? Her, <laughs> her first book was on foreknowledge and uh, and free will. The uh, I have to say I don't remember that paper, but I do remember the marvelous uh, semester when. Uh, when you were here. We, I, I, we've never missed an opportunity uh, to have her back since that, uh, uh, since that visit. Uh, Linda is now both, and I got this clarified this morning, it's a little unclear from her CV. Uh, she is both the Kingfisher College Chair of the Philosophy of Religion and Ethics at the University of Oklahoma and the George and Lynn Cross Research Professor of the University of Oklahoma, it's sort of piling these chairs on top of uh, one another. Her philosophical education involved what we might call the California trifecta. Uh, she got a BA from Stanford, an MA from Berkeley, and drifted downstate for her PhD in 1979 from UCLA. I suspect she might be the only person who ever got that trifecta. It's an unusual in philosophy. I don't know what happened to Biola and all that, but uh, Stanford, Berkeley, and UCLA aren't bad. Since that time, she's written on a broad range of topics in ethics, philosophy of religion, epistemology, and free will, uh, where, she, where she started, in a sense, free will, and did a lot of early work in philosophy of language. She's been one of the most creative participants in the revival of virtue ethics that got underway in earnest in the 1980s, and she was very much a part of that. In addition to her now classic 1996 book on virtu in virtue ethics, Virtues of the Mind, she also published Divine Motivation Theory, uh, a few years later in which she combines insights from ethics and philosophy of religion. Currently she's completing a monograph on exemplarist virtue ethics which will extend even further her work in virtue ethics and sort of build on some of the work in divine motivation uh, theory. Her most recent book, Epistemic Authority, A Theory of Trust, Authority and Autonomy in and Autonomy and Belief appeared just last year and follows on much work in epistemology she's done over the past couple of decades, including her 2008 monograph on epistemology. Her work in philosophy of religion, which is spread over countless articles, is exemplified in her 2007 book, honored as a choice outstanding associate book of, uh, uh, sorry, the, the choice outstanding academic book of 2008. It was published in 2007. I suppose it wasn't quite so outstanding then, but by 2008 <laughs> it became an outstanding academic book. Uh, it's titled Philosophy of Religion and Historical Introduction. Linda's also been honored by being invited to give many prestigious endowed lectureships including the Weill Lectures on Natural Religion at, at Oxford, the Aquinas Lecture at Marquette, the Petri uh, Lectureship at the University of Uppsala, the Kaminsky Lectureship at the Catholic University of Lublin in Poland, and the Romanel Phi Beta Kappa Lectures in this country. She's also been president of both the Society of Christian Philosophers and the American Catholic Philosophical Association. She will be speaking this morning on good persons, good aims, and the problem of evil. Uh, join me in welcoming Linda Zagzewski. Thank you. Well, it is indeed a joy to be here. Um, as uh, David mentioned, I go way back. And the first talk I ever gave professionally was here at a meeting of the Society of Christian Philosophers. And I remember I thought this place was heaven. I just loved it. So, uh, but I haven't been here for several years, so this is really, this is really terrific to be able to be here and um, talk about something different than I usually talk about. This, as you know, Jim Sturba wanted us, gave us an assignment to think about contemporary moral theory and the problem of evil. And I hadn't been thinking about that for some years, but 
I dutifully did it, and I even have something to say about the Pauline principle, even though I've never written about that. There is a handout. I hope everyone has a handout. Um, I decided that the paper uh, would be clearer if you have a rather detailed handout, which I will, so I'm not actually going to read the paper. There is a paper if you want it, I'll send it to you. But I'm going to, um, you know, partly read and partly speak um, from the handout. Now, it seems to me that standard formulations of the argument from evil claim that an omnipotent being who is perfectly good would not permit, or probably would not permit, the vast quantity and severity of evil in the world. And in doing so, these arguments have an implied assumption about the motivational structure of a good being. Examples of the sort of assumption I have in mind are given on your handout. First one, 1A, is from J.L. Mackey in his classic paper, 1955 paper, where Mackey says, a good being always eliminates evil as far as it can. Another example is from Thule's Stanford Encyclopedia entry on problem of evil. Thule says, uh, if God is morally perfect, God has the desire to eliminate all evil. Third example is Roe, an omniscient holy good being would prevent the occurrence of any intense suffering it could, unless it could not do so without thereby losing some greater good or permitting some evil equally bad or worse. Now, in spite of some differences, they all affirm a connection between being a good being and acting with the aim of eliminating evil. Usually the aim of eliminating evil is connected with the aim of producing good. So an initial formulation of the assumption that I believe they're making is this, too, on the handout. A good person aims to produce good and prevent evil. Now, uh, let me just make a little remark about I changed the word being to person to signal that these people are not talking about good beings like stars and flowers. They're talking about beings who act intentionally. Okay, but I don't think I'm importing any assumptions that they wouldn't make. Okay, so how do Mackey, Tooley, and Rowe make this assumption? Well, if you look at Mackey's premise, that premise actually goes beyond two, right? I mean, it doesn't just say that a good person aim, aims at producing good and preventing evil. It says it succeeds in eliminating evil if it can. I assume then that Mackey would accept that a good being aims at producing good and preventing evil. Um, Thule, Thule's assumption might appear to be weaker than two because Thule's assumption just says if God is morally perfect, God has the desire to eliminate. And you might think desiring is weaker than aiming at something. However, if you look at the rest of um, Thule's argument, which I haven't given you, there is a premise that I think makes it clear you would accept too, because he says, if a being has the desire to eliminate evil, knows how to eliminate evil, has the power to eliminate evil, it would eliminate evil. So the sense in which Thule's using desire does imply aiming. I mean, that, that such a being would aim at eliminating evil, I think. Rowe's version mentions intense suffering as his example of evil. And this is interesting. He doesn't say evil in this premise. He says intense suffering. And that raises the question of whether he might say that a holy good being would prevent intense suffering even if intense suffering was not in the category of evil. And that suggests that the conceptual connections between the motivational motive, motives of a good being differ with respect to suffering and with, with respect to evil, that there may be some, con some di differences uh, between 
uh, <coughs> the motives of a good being as directed towards suffering than as directed towards evil. I myself think the problem of suffering is actually a, a harder problem uh, than the problem of evil per se. But I'm not going to talk about that in this talk. I'm going to assume what I think is the most straightforward interpretation of this argument, where intense suffering is being used as an example of evil. So it's suffering qua evil that he's referring to, and if so, then it seems to me Roe is assuming too, a good being, a good person, aims at producing good and preventing evil. Um, now, let's look at two. Two might appear innocuous, after all, all it really says is that two properties go together, the property of being a good person and the property of aiming at producing good and preventing evil, a being who has the first property has the second property. Um, and, and so it might not seem, it seems innocuous. Um, of course, you know that a good being does more than to aim at good outcomes, a good being has virtues and does good acts, we'll get back to that, doing good acts may not be the same thing as aiming at good outcomes. Uh, but nonetheless, two may seem to you to be, you know, reasonable, plausible. But there's different interpretations of two that are dramatically different. And so I'm going to give you the two most dramatically different uh, interpretations on the handout. 2A is one way of reading two. Think of them as reading two in different directions, I guess you could say. So one interpretation, two is saying 2A, a condition for being a good person is that she aims at producing good states of affairs and preventing evil states of affairs. Whereas 2B says a condition for something being a good state of affairs and something else in evil state of affairs is that a good person aims at producing the former and preventing the latter. So according to 2A, the evil of a state of affairs is a more basic property than the goodness of persons. The possession of the property of aiming to eliminate evil is a condition for the possession of the property of being a good person. So the property of being good, a good person is derivative, in some sense we'll have to talk about, from the property of being, of, of, of state of affairs being evil. And what makes a, a person have the property of being a good person is that that person aims at eliminating evil. Um, okay, so that's 2A. 2B is just the reverse. And to B, the goodness of persons is more basic. A good person aims to produce good and, and eliminate evil because what counts as good and what counts as evil is just what good persons aim to do. Okay. Now, to bring out this difference, um, here's a, an example from another kind of another philosophical discussion. Take the statement, virtuous persons act rightly. This is something you know you see <coughs> commonly in discussions of virtue ethics. There's two ways of reading that. So one way is to read it as saying, virtuous persons are the persons who act rightly, where acting rightly comes first and virtuous persons are defined in terms of doing right acts. The other way of reading it is, right acts are the acts that virtuous persons do, where being virtuous comes first and right acts are defined via virtuous persons. So this kind of you know, what, what this <coughs> difference in the way of reading the direction of a statement like two actually has analogs in other discussions, I think, uh, other philosophical discussions, such as this one about virtue. OK, so I've given you two quite different, dramatically different interpretations of two. Um, but they're not the only interpretations of two. There are others. So here's two more. Um, somebody might say two just because they think that there's a correlation between being a good person and aiming to produce good and prevent evil. Um, 
there's really no deep connection between them. It's just a correlation. Um, if that's what the person means who affirms two, that's not going to be as, as interesting as if it's 2A or 2B, but somebody might mean that. Another interpretation, which I'm not going to talk about too much, but another interpretation is that um, being virtuous, or rather being a good person and aiming at preventing evil, producing good and preventing evil, might go together because each is connected with some third thing that is a more basic value or a more basic bearer of value than either one of them. Such as, for example, X. So it could be that the goodness or badness of X is, you know, the really basic bearer of value. And then good persons are defined by X, by their X, and aims are defined in some way relative to X. Um, so that's another possibility. Okay, so I'm, I'm simply pointing out that, that I think people typically in these discussions assume two, and there's a lot of interpretations of what two amounts to. But now I want to say that typical proponents of the argument from evil, as well as probably most of its attackers, although I don't want to name names, I don't know who they would be, but a lot of them, I think, assume two in the sense of 2A. Okay. So, that is, they assume that a condition for being a good person is that that person aims to produce evil and uh, produce evil, yeah. produce good and eliminate evil. And you can see that by the dialectical structure of the argument, where the evil of states of affairs comes first. These evils are designated in advance. There are certain evils in the world, the evil of which can be determined independently of the goodness of persons. And then the goodness of a person depends upon that person aiming to eliminate those states of affairs that are evil in a way that's compatible with also aiming at producing good. Then the fact that God apparently does not aim to eliminate those evils is grounds for retracting the hypothesis that God is good. So that, me, as I'm suggesting, is the structure of these arguments puts the hypothesis, treats the, the, the statement that God is good as a hypothesis that can be retracted given the alleged evidence that, um, in, that, that this being does not aim to eliminate these independently identified evils. Um, notice that the argument from evil really doesn't get going if you, if you interpret to in the sense of to be. So if, if you took two as to be, then the apparent fact that a perfectly good God permits the states of affairs of this world would not be grounds for retracting the hypothesis that God is good. Rather, it would be grounds for retracting the hypothesis that those states of affairs are evil. Um, there's uh, the other interpretations of to also prevent the argument from evil from getting the desired conclusion without additional assumptions, but I'm, not, I'm actually not going to discuss those. But this is just to show you that I think that to get the argument from evil the way it is typically given in the dialectic that it usually has, the, the, the person discussing the argument, whether they're a proponent of the argument or an attacker of the argument, typically assume 2A, okay? Now, what should we say about 2A? Well, 2A says that a condition for being a good person is that she aims at producing good and preventing evil. But then, this raises the question, what kind of condition? It could be a metaphysical condition, or it could be an epistemic condition. So I'm going to consider both interpretations, and I'm going to argue that there's problems with both interpretations. So let's start with the metaphysical interpretation. Let's take 2A as the claim, a claim about the, the way the moral properties of persons are connected with the good and evil states of affairs. Interpreted this way, most straightforward way of interpreting 2A, is three on your handout. 
the goodness or badness of persons is derivative from the goodness or badness of the states of affairs they aim to bring about or prevent. According to three, moral goodness or badness flows backwards from the evaluative properties of states of affairs to the moral properties of the aims to bring about those states of affairs or prevent them, and then from there to the moral properties of the persons who have those aims. So I have a little diagram to show you how this, you know, states of affairs, good or evil, and aims, and then persons. So the value sort of flows in that direction. Consequentialism gives us a familiar model of the way value is transferred in this way. I'm not suggesting that an adherent of three must be a consequentialist because three makes no reference to acts at all. But I mention consequentialism because I think it's picture of the way value flows backwards from what is intrinsically good or bad to what is derivatively good or bad is the same as in three. And I think this means that some well-known objections to consequentialism are also objections to three. And I'm going to give you two, two objections. So the first objection is the Pauline principle. Now, I mean, this isn't an objection unless you think the Pauline principle is true, but I'm going to at least, you know, I'm going to give you hypotheses, objections that I think that are reasonable and which have a pretty good historical tradition behind them. Now, the traditional Pauline principle says never do good that, or never do evil that good may come of it. This principle identifies, I think, one of the most important problems with consequentialism. That consequentialism demands the performance of vicious acts in certain circumstances, the standard example of which is the killing of innocent persons to save many lives. Acts of that kind are said to be intrinsically evil. I take that to mean they are evil just because of the kind of act that they are just because they are acts of a certain kind. They fall under a certain description. Uh, one way to think or to look at this is to think of commandments. Thou shalt not kill or thou shalt not lie. Acts that fall under the description intended by the commandment are evil um, as such. That is, they are evil just because they are acts of that kind. And then as such, they cannot or they do not derive their moral status from their consequences or any states of affairs external to the act. Notice a couple things about this Pauline principle. Um, it's not necessary to think that the Pauline principle has no exceptions to see the problem. Um, you don't need to think that the Pauline principle is an absolute principle to see the problem. If consequentialism ever re morally requires what a morally good person would not do, then it seems to me there's a problem with consequentialism. If so, that means, second, that this uh, view that acts can be evil intrinsically constitutes an objection to three as well as an objection to consequentialist ethics. Given that three says that the goodness of a person derives from the aim of producing good and preventing evil, then the goodness of a person on this line can require the aim of killing an innocent person to save other lives. If, as a matter of fact, a good person would not kill an innocent person to save lives, then her goodness cannot be derived from the aim of producing good and preventing evil. Third, I think this means that the general meta-ethical issue that's raised by the Pauline principle does not actually require that there are intrinsically evil acts. That's because I think the key insight of the Pauline principle is that the moral properties of acts do not derive or don't always derive 
from the value of the states of affairs at which the agent aims. So I'm proposing that the key insight of the Pauline principle is that the goodness or evil of the act does not always derive from the goodness or evil of the states of affairs at which the agent aims. But that's actually compatible with two positions, two different positions. Possibility one and possibility two. I need better names, but anyway. Okay, possibility one is that there are intrinsically good or evil acts and the moral pro properties of persons derived from the moral properties of acts, as I have in the diagram. Possibility two is that the moral properties of acts derive from the features of persons as in the diagram for possibility two. Notice that in both cases, there's no arrow between Shakespeare and the acts. Okay. So these are two different ways, I will say, in which three could be false. Okay, let's talk about possibility one. Possibility is one in which there can be an intrinsically evil act, or an act the evil of which does not derive from anything outside the kind of act that it is. As I mentioned, standard examples are things like killing and intentionally killing the innocent. Lying is another standard example. Now, why think that there are acts like that which are intrinsically evil? Now, this is a really big question, and I'm going to give you a quick answer, just, just to soften you up. Um, but I'm not going to give an answer that has anything to do with commandments. So I'm not going to talk about commandments. That's a different answer. But here's a, an answer to why somebody would think that there are intrinsically evil acts. Suppose that lying is intentionally telling a falsehood to get someone to believe a falsehood. Now, the badness of that act cannot derive from the badness of someone's believing a falsehood. Because even though believing a falsehood is a not a very good thing. The badness of lying differs both in kind and in degree from the badness of believing a falsehood. The badness of lying is actually much worse than the badness of the state of affairs of someone's believing a falsehood. It's much worse and it's actually worse in a different way. It's badness is a different sort of badness. That at least indicates, gives you some reason to think, that the badness of lying can't derive from the badness of the state of affairs at which the, aim, the act aims. I mean, it could be, this seems pretty obvious, I guess, it could be that the act wouldn't be bad unless the state of affairs of people believing a falsehood is bad. That could be true. But what I'm suggesting is that the badness that lying has does not derive from the bad, or can't wholly derive from the badness of the, of someone's believing a falsehood. It may be conditional on the fact that believing a falsehood is a bad thing. But the bad, it's a different kind of badness and a different degree of badness than the badness of believing a falsehood. Same point applies to intentionally killing an innocent person. An innocent person dying is a bad thing. But murder is much worse than just the death of an innocent person, right? There's something, uh, a kind of badness, a kind of evil that is both greater in degree and greater in kind than the badness of someone's dying. Same point applies to horrific ways of dying. Dying in a fire, dying in an earthquake are horrible things. But if someone actually intentionally sets fire to the person or makes them burn alive or burn to death in a fire, that's a way worse uh, kind and degree of badness than the death of the person in the fire. Um, and what I want to say is the way I look at this, I think the way this line ought to go, is that the extra kind and degree of badness of the ex is in the intentions of the agent. If there's something disordered in the will of the agent in these cases. And if that's the case, then the badness of the act does not derive uh, from the state of affairs at which the act aims. 
I think, actually, that the same point could be applied to intrinsic goodness, although I, I really don't know if anybody talks about this. Um, all the relevant discussions seem to have to do with intrinsic evil, not intrinsic goodness. But, um, I mean, you might say the same thing about intrins intrinsic goodness. Someone getting peace and comfort in their grief is a good thing. It's good that they find peace and comfort. But it's an even better thing if someone intentionally gives them the peace and comfort. It's, a better, it's better both in kind and degree. So there may be both good and bad acts, the value of which does not derive from the value of the state of affairs at which the agent aims. Now take a look at possibility one again. In that possibility, in that diagram, the moral properties of a person who performs an act derive from the moral properties of the act she performs. That is, she's a good person because of her acts. The moral properties of some of those acts are intrinsic. So it follows that the moral properties of persons do not derive exclusively from the goodness or badness of the states of affairs at which those persons aim. Three on this view, therefore, would be false, and so 2A in its metaphysical interpretation should be rejected. Now I'm going to give you a, another possibility. That's also suggested to me by the Pauline principle, but this is my view. I don't know if anybody else has this view. Um, possibility two is like possibility one in that the moral status of an act does not derive from the states of affairs, but the value of an act is not intrinsic either. Instead, the moral status of an act derives from features of persons. <laughs> So here, roughly, is how this line would go. A person's intentional acts express states of the person. They express love, hate, respect, honor, pride, envy, and so on. States that arguably have intrinsic value or disvalue. If so, when a person intentionally kills an innocent person, the badness of the act derives from the fact that such an act expresses dishonoring of innocent human life, which is a disordered quality of the person. So on this picture, the personal quality of dishonoring <coughs> innocent human life is intrinsically bad. And any act that expresses the dishonor of innocent human life is bad derivatively. It is bad because it expresses an intrinsically bad state. And three would then be false on this view also. So I've given you two ways to think uh, that the metaphysical interpretation of 2A is false, or two different ways of looking at it. And I want to suggest that the picture of the flow of value given in the diagrams for possibilities one and two really do deserve some attention in discussions of the source of the value of X. So there's three alternatives, not one. X can be intrinsically good or bad. They could be good or bad because of their connection to states of affairs that they aim to bring about. Or they could be good or bad because of the qualities of persons that are expressed in such X. Three requires two. That is, three requires that it be the case that acts are good or bad because of their connections to the states of affairs they aim to bring about. So if defenders of the argument from evil assume 2A in its metaphysical interpretation 3, they should be prepared to defend 3 against these other two possibilities. Okay, there's one other well-known problem with consequentialism that I think uh, applies to three. And I mean, most of you know this so well, I'm just going to say, summarize it briefly. Bernard Williams argues that utilitarianism demands of agents that they ignore their self and the story of their lives when doing so has better consequences. So personal projects, plans, values, 
must be overridden when dictated by the utility calculus. Now, personal values include many things that are distinctive of the individual person. For example, taking care of one's own children, developing loving relationships with particular other persons, embarking on a career in philosophy, developing one's talent for music, taking up a hobby in gardening or genealogical research. Each of these projects involves an extended commitment of time, resources, and energy that could otherwise be used to maximize good from an impersonal viewpoint. If utilitarianism demands of a person the sacrifice of these deep commitments for the sake of the consequences, then, Williams argues, utilitarianism attacks integrity in one of its senses. Now, I hasten to remind you that Williams does think that sometimes one is morally required to make such sacrifices. So he doesn't think of integrity as an absolute value. Sometimes you simply have to sacrifice integrity because of what's at stake in that situation. <coughs> but what he's objecting to is a theory in which one is morally required to systematically sacrifice or give up or not even have uh, life plans and projects because the utility calculus requires that they um, have to always act in such a way that maximizes good from an impersonal standpoint. Now notice that this objection also applies to three. So it seems to me that the problem that Williams is talking about is that if the moral status of persons derives from the value of consequences at which they aim, then it doesn't matter what a person honors, loves, cares about, as long as she aims to produce good and eliminate evil. But we define ourselves in part by what we care about and how we design our lives around the things we care about. But according to three, the way we define ourselves is irrelevant to our moral status as persons, except insofar as we define ourselves in a way that lines up with the value of consequences. If so, the Williams objection from integrity, I think, is not simply an objection to a certain way of evaluating the morality of acts. It's an objection to a certain way of evaluating the moral status of persons. Now I want to suggest that the Williams objection applies to the problem of evil because God has a life. God is a person, or trinity of persons, with a life. Scripture reveals that God has plans. Presumably not all divine plans are revealed. But enough of them are revealed that we can, some of us, can develop or have developed, in fact, have developed theodicies that refer to a divine plan of life, a divine plan of his own life that includes mutual sharing between God and his creatures. So let me mention Marilyn's Christological approach to the problem of evil as an example of the point I want to make here. In Marilyn's approach, the story by which Christ defeats the horrors of human life is a component of a narrative of the divine life. So I'm <coughs> interpreting it as that being, that's an important feature, that, that the, the story by which Christ defeats horrors is actually a component of the divine life. The stories of individual human lives in the life of the church are held together by the Christological narrative, and that narrative is a component of God's plan for his own life. It's important in this narrative, as I understand it, that defeating evils in a life is not a matter of producing goods that outweigh the evils. Evils in a life are elements in the organic narrative structure of a life. And the goodness of the life is not an outcome of the process of living. It's not like an end result of the process of living. So if the integrity objection applies to ordinary human beings, 
it seems to me it applies all the more to the creator who's designed for his own life and communion with his creatures, cannot be superseded by a demand to calculate the value of outcomes of each divine choice. Another example of this kind of approach is Eleanor Stumps, reflections on biblical narratives which reveal the way evil and suffering are components of a larger narrative in which God desires union with human persons. So what I'm suggesting here is a link, a link between the Williams integrity objection to consequentialism and defenses of evil that focus on a narrative of the divine life. And so my hypothesis here is that three, proposition three, attacks the integrity of, of God. Three attacks the integrity of God. Now, a problem that I must mention, because it's kind of obvious, I guess, is why, you, were, you will still ask, why would such a person as God design a life in which his creatures must suffer? Um, I already mentioned to you that I think of the problem of suffering as different than the problem of evil per se, the problem of evil as such. Um, and the problem of suffering is a very serious difficulty, but what I'm trying to, uh, my point here, is that it's not the problem that a good person aims at producing good and eliminating evil. That's, that's the object of my attack here. Or at least I'm giving you a hypothesis of ways it could be attacked. Okay, let's look next at 2A as in its epistemic <coughs> interpretation. So it's possible that the proponent of 2A, the person who says a condition for being a good person is the person who aims to eliminate evil, is treated as an epistemic condition rather than a metaphysical condition. So someone might think something like this. Well, it's easier to identify evil states of affairs than to identify good persons. And a criterion for thinking that some person is good is that that person aims to eliminate what we take to be evil. Aiming and eliminating independently identified evils may not be a condition for being a good person, but reasonably believing that some person aims at eliminating independently identify these evils is a condition for reasonably believing that that person is good. So understood then, 2A is proposition four in your handout, a necessary condition for reasonably judging that, that some person is good is that one reasonably judges that that person aims to produce good and prevent evil. Uh, forget necessary doesn't mean metaphysically necessary, that's not very well. I mean, the idea is one is reasonable in judging that some person is good, only if she's reasonable in judging that that person aims to eliminate evils that have been independently identified. So see how this works. Consider the following set of potential beliefs. One, God is a good person. Two, evil is an evil. X is an evil state of affairs. And three, God does not aim to prevent or eliminate X. The proponent of four says that two and three have epistemic priority over one. So one reasonably ought to make a judgment such as two and three in advance of a judgment about God's goodness, given certain background assumptions, including assumptions about God's knowledge and power and the other goods that God can produce and evils God can eliminate. Four says that judging two and three is grounds for judging the negation of one, or at least it's grounds for being skeptical of one. So belief one is treated as epistemically less well-grounded than two and three because the grounds for any judgment of God's goodness include judgments like two and three. They include judgments about God's aims and what is evil. So this raises the question, how do people reasonably form the belief that God is good? Right? I mean, that's what this is about. 
Is it because they look at the world, see that it is good, mostly good, and see that God aims to eliminate evils in it? Or do they know that God is good in some other way, perhaps through scripture and tradition, the teaching authority of the church? Maybe they're philosophers, and they think that God is pure goodness, and they have, you know, a long argument for that. So many of these reasons for believing one are independent of beliefs about the existence and quantity of evils in the world and beliefs about God's aims. The belief one might or might not be well grounded, but I don't see that the issue of whether one is reasonable is dependent upon, that it's settled by, prior judgments about the evil of states of affairs and God's aims. For comparison, notice that the adherent of 2B, two, two if, you, if you treat it 2B as an epistemic principle, 2B says a condition for something being a good state of affairs and something else an evil state of affairs is that a good person aims at producing the former and preventing the latter. If you were treating that as an epistemic principle, you will do the reverse. You would say that one and three have epistemic priority over two. Right? I mean, because 2A and 2B are rules for how to, how to evaluate the relative reasonableness of this set of propositions. Um, so if you were using 2B, then reasonably judging 1 and 3 would be grounds for skepticism regarding 2. Another possibility is that someone uses 1 and 2 as grounds for skepticism regarding 3. I mean, if you already believe independently God is good and that these things are evil, then that might be reason for skepticism regarding the view that God does not aim to eliminate those evils. Another possibility is that a person denies two in any form. I mentioned that briefly at the beginning. Uh, if you deny two in any form, you might not even detect a tension among one, two, and three. I mean, you know, you wouldn't even think that there's a conflict here that needs to be resolved. Now, my own suspicion is that, or I could say conjecture, not a suspicion, conjecture is that most theists are unwilling to use either 2A or 2B as an epistemic principle. Although they're probably willing to say 2 is true in some sense. Some sense that maybe hasn't been fully you know, worked out. Um, and they don't use either 2A or 2B as principles because they form the judgments 1, 2, and 3 at least partly independently of each other. So there's no rule about how a reasonable person adjudicates the conflict among one, two, and three. In any case, I do want to suggest that it's someone who supposes that four ought to be adopted as an epistemic principle should be prepared to defend it against these other alternatives. So let me just end with a summary. In this paper, I have argued that standard versions of the argument from evil assume two. Good persons aim to produce good and eliminate or prevent evil. Where the context of the argu argument makes it most natural to interpret two as 2A, a condition for being a good person is that she aims at producing good states of affairs and preventing evil ones. The kind of condition intended in 2A can be either metaphysical or epistemic. <laughs> Interpreted metaphysically, the thesis assumed in 2A is 3. The goodness or badness of persons is derivative from the goodness or badness of the states of affairs they aim to bring about or prevent. Then I argue that two objections to consequentialist ethics are also objections to 3. First, the Pauline principle that one should not do evil to produce good 
is both an objection to the view that the moral properties of acts derive from the moral properties of their consequences and to the view that the moral properties of persons derive from the moral properties of the states of affairs at which they aim. There may be acts a good person would not do, either because of the kind of act that it is, that's possibility one, because the act is intrinsically evil, <coughs> or because the act expresses qualities a good person does not have. It expresses intrinsically bad properties of a person. That's possibility two. Second, the famous integrity objection by Bernard Williams arises from a view of persons as having the moral right to design lives the goodness of which is not an outcome at which they aim. A good person lives a good life, but a good life is not solely a function of how good a job that person does in aiming to produce the best outcome. And I've suggested that, I guess I sort of left this out, didn't I? Um, that that objection actually connects very well with narrative um, uh, defenses of evil, such as the one that Marilyn Adams has given. If instead 2A is interpreted epistemically, the thesis assumed is the following for a condition for reasonably judging that some person is good is that one reasonably judges that that person aims to produce good and prevent evil. Four is a principle in moral epistemology that makes the judgment, one, God is a good person, derivative from the judgments, X is an evil state of affairs, and, X, and God does not aim to prevent or eliminate X. I have not argued that four is false, only that it is far from obvious and there are other alternatives. I think narrative theodicies actually can weaken four as well as three, although I, I didn't mention that, but I think you can see how the same sort of move can work for the epistemic version of 2A as for the metaphysical version. Um, these theodicies do that by revealing ways in which we find out the goodness of God without reference to God's aims. Thank you. Thanks very much, Linda. Linda seeks to provide a novel critique of proponents of the argument from evil, such as Mackey, Tooley, and Rowe. They all, she claims, implicitly endorse two, which is a good person aims at producing good and preventing evil where the morality of the consequences is understood as primary. But many theist critics of the argument from evil, like skeptical theists, seem to endorse something like two. Let's call it two prime, which is a good person aims at producing good and preventing evil. And in the case of God, many of the goods God aims at producing and evils God aims at preventing are beyond our ken. So does Linda think that these theists are at least equally subject to her critique as the non-theists against whom she directs her critique? And how about the relationship of both groups to the Pauline principle? Never do evil that good may come of it. Despite the weaknesses that Linda points out in Mackey's view, might his, quote, a good being always eliminates evil as far as it can, end of quote, have more in common with the Pauline principle than anything that skeptical theists Endorse. Do you want to respond yeah, to Jim briefly? Say, and then we'll open the floor to questions. Since Jim asked me questions, I guess I'll, I'll answer them. Thank you, Jim, for your questions. Um, so um, the first question was whether um, skeptical theists get. Uh, uh, well, you said theistic critics, particularly skeptical theists, might also seem to be endorsing something like two or two, 
You didn't it's say 2A, two two well, but you meant 2A. Prim okay. Okay. in terms of the consequences. So right, okay. So you're asking me if skeptical theists, in addition to the atheist attackers, are assuming 2A. And I did briefly allude to that in the talk. I think many of them do. Mm -hmm. But I didn't want to name names. So I thought they could speak for themselves. Um, if you want to you know, elaborate, then that would be good. But I don't, I don't, I guess I have the suspicion that they do, but I don't want to, you know, put this on people who will, you know, are perfectly capable of telling me whether or not they assume 2A. Um, and the other question was one I didn't quite understand. Um, you think that Mackey's view might have more in common with the Pauline principle than the, anything the skeptical theist endorses. Mm -hmm. So the, the uh, Mackey's view that a good being always eliminates evil as far as it can, are you saying that does not assume 2A? Well, it took a little bit of massaging for you to get Mackey and, and even, well, truly easier maybe to get Mackey into endorsing 2 and 2, well, 2A. Two uh, you know, all he's spoken out about is eliminating evil. He hasn't said anything about really maximizing good. <coughs> uh, right, so okay, that. good. Okay, but, um, all right, just, so, so suppose we are looking at, um, uh, just one, just half a two way. Mm -hmm. A condition for being a good person is that she aims at preventing evil states of affairs. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't he endorse that? He may, may do that, yes. And yes. then wouldn't my objection still apply? Um, yeah, but then again, parallel to the skeptical theists who are now not focusing on eliminating evils, but, but focusing on doing overall good. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I see. So they're, they're so away, they embrace way away the from the Pauline principle. Yeah, 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 I see. Okay, um, but, but, but Matthew doesn't seem very close to the Pauline principle because he didn't no, say anything about the but, but he's lives. not close to utilitarianism either. I mean, we know yeah. what his real view is. It's not, it's not a, yeah. it's an air view sort yeah. of. Uh, so I, I, I always, all you've got for him in this context is this principle about avoiding evil. And, okay. and so, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll call on questioners. Uh, Carl first, and then yeah. uh, thanks. Uh, so that was just excellent. Really, fitting well with the other excellent papers. So thanks a lot. Uh, these are really simple things. I'm embarrassed to ask them. I'm so much on your side and early objections, but thanks for drawing attention to uh, maybe the priority of X over states of affairs, and then the complicated relationship between X and persons. Uh, I can imagine someone saying, "Well, there's always a symmetry because." X would be good to the extent that you know good persons would do them, and, and good persons are ones who could do good acts, whatever. But uh, what about just a really elementary point? Uh, I've got another question for later, maybe. But uh, that um, just phenomenologically, it's, this is just so artificial. So X never exists on the wrong. Not like billiard ball is separate from one another. Yeah. Right. No human. Act. <laughs> there just, is no act. Just there is no. I mean, yeah. we just for purposes yeah. of analysis, we pretend that. Right. But nobody. Right. Doesn't individual act. It's impossible right. for the person to do yeah. So that would, I mean, if you had to choose between yeah. two, then you could just split up by saying, well, of course, this thing. There's this thing we can do. We can do the analysis of what yes. Kant calls the the ills or the wheel and woe of X and states of affairs as such. And then there's this other thing, which is the evaluation of the person character yes. or the will, whatever you want to call it. Good. 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 So. Yes. Okay. Yes. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I did think of that, and I thought, you know, I don't really have any more developed account of what an act is, and um, how it connects to personal properties and so on. So, but let me let me make sure I, I, I see your point. So, would you <coughs> be at least suggesting that possibilities one and two amount to the same thing? Well, uh, if you say, or at so. least they're, <laughs> they're not. <coughs> you no, know, when you make a diagram, it looks. You may, you just change the direction of arrows, it looks like a big difference, right? But if you think persons really aren't separated from their acts in any important sense, it's only for the purposes of analysis that we even talk about acts. 
I mean, we do talk about act, acts of abstraction from persons, but we just sort of make that up. Um, well, I mean, it did occur to me what I th thought you might be getting at is that depending upon how you work out the connection between persons and their acts, possibilities one and two are, are really don't have much of a difference that anybody should get excited about. As long as we're talking about possible acts. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I think they're different, but I'm not, I'm not willing to make a big point about I mean, I, I'm, I'll, I'll yeah. concede that. i got to tell you who credit's for, but maybe for later. If you want. So are you okay? Yeah. Well, we have a lot of hands, but uh, I'll try to get everybody in. Uh, Dustin, then Peter, then Nevin for the next three. Um, thanks. I was a little bit confused about why you think um, the argument from evil can't get off the ground if 2B is used instead of 2A. Um, so when I was an undergraduate at William & Mary, I had an acquaintance who was uh, a Maoist. He had been corrupted by the Marxists in the English department. Um, so suppose he made the claim Chairman Mao was a good person. Uh, and I say, no, Chairman Mao wasn't a good person. This is why. Uh, good people don't commit atrocities. Uh, the Cultural Revolution was an atrocity. Uh, Chairman Mao committed it, uh, therefore Chairman Mao wasn't a good person. Um, mm -hmm. And he says, well, wait a minute, you're assuming that uh, we can identify, uh, or sorry, you're assuming that uh, the goodness and badness of states of affairs, of, uh, or the status of an action as an atrocity is explanatorily prior to uh, moral evaluation of persons. Um, but I think it's the other way around. I'm some sort of virtue ethicist. Um, so really, given that Chairman Mao's a good person, what this tells us is that uh, the, the Cultural Revolution wasn't an atrocity, right? Um, I would think that that would just be beside the point, because all I need to know is that good people don't commit atrocities, and the Cultural Revolution was an atrocity. And it doesn't make any difference whether it was an atrocity because a good person wouldn't commit it, or whether a good person wouldn't commit it because it was an atrocity. And lots of people can know those things without yeah. Okay, so um, 2B is a version of 2 in which the goodness of persons precedes, and sometimes has to be determined what that means, the badness, the goodness or badness of the states of affairs, of states of affairs in the world that they in. Um, and uh, so the idea is if uh, if, if you think of God as pure goodness or something like that, well then um, what counts as good and evil is going to be dependent upon what God aims at. That the evil, goodness and evil state of affairs is not, is not prior to the goodness of the person. Now if you said, well wait a minute, hold on a minute. Um, you can't tell me that somebody who comes to me and says, here's my argument, Chairman Mao is a good person, Chairman Mao aimed at doing X, and therefore X is not an atrocity, is a good argument. I'm saying, of course you're right, it's not a good argument at all. Um, my point is that you're only going to use 2B um, provided that you think you have some, I mean, you're actually going to use this provided that you have some way of designating, identifying the, person, the good persons in advance. So it's a question of which comes first, the goodness of the person or the goodness of the states of affairs. And you're, presumably you don't <coughs> think um, that people, I mean, I'm certainly not suggesting that anybody who would use to be is going, is going to think that um, um, people can identify the good persons any way they want and then identify states of affairs as good or evil relative to what those persons aim at. So I'm not suggesting at all that you don't need to have a defense for thinking that some person is good before you use to be. But presumably the people who are giving the argument from evil do think they have a defense for the claim that God is good. And then if they use to be, you get a very different conclusion that if you used to win. Yeah, my thought is just, I'll oh, stop. Her. My thought is just, the claim is the argument from evil can't get off the ground uh, if 2B is used. My thought is just, if the, if the person presenting the argument makes the claim, I know what good people are like, and I know yeah. uh, what things are good and bad, I know what good people would yeah. do, 
they don't need, and normal people can know all sorts of stuff about that without taking any position in this debate. So you might think. But isn't that? that I mean, aren't you stuff. really saying? I mean, to me, what? I mean, what I, the, what I hear you really saying is it's not so much about two B. What it, it, I think it's the point I made towards the end of the paper that reasonable pe reasonable people people actually use neither two A nor two B systematically. Um, Rather, they have some independent ways of identifying good persons and some independent ways of identifying who the states are there in such a cultural revolution. And then they have to decide what to do, you know, like how to adjudicate the alleged conflict between those two beliefs and the belief that this person, good person doesn't end up in the states are there. So they don't, I actually think of you really not. Reasonable persons use neither one of them. Neither one of those. You should know. Peter. Uh, so let's see, Proposition 3 is the goodness or badness of persons is derivative from the goodness or badness of the states of affairs they came up framing out of preventing. And at one point you say that 3 attacks the integrity of God. Mm -hmm. um, that's just, of course, the sort of slogan that could provide yeah. a uh, sophisticated statement yeah. that you made. Now, I'm no proponent of three. I guess that would tend towards some kind of common cause mm -hmm. theory that will kind of very you just mm -hmm. uh, passed over very briefly. But I'm still, I'm still puzzled by this statement. I mean, uh, couldn't it be that say, two way is consistent, at least, with saying that God is good and aims primarily and uh, uh, bring about the integrity of his own divine life without regard uh, for uh, goodness, uh, maximizing goodness or badness. Uh, I mean, it could still uh, be that that's his primary aim, but yeah. uh, some subordinating uh, right. goodness. Right, like his. right. So, um, so I understood Williams to be saying uh, not that people shouldn't aim at producing good and eliminating evil, uh, as in personally. No, I think I think Williams has a good objection to three. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. I'm just saying that the, I'm just, then, the question is whether three attacks uh, uh, the integrity of God. Of God. Maybe, maybe God can do this. Uh, okay. So you're saying you are you? Is it that you think that God, there's something different about God's integrity that would make? The Williams objection. Well, it, it could be that God's plan for maximizing the integrity of the divine yeah. uh, life includes as a necessary uh, component maximizing for creatures uh, good and minimizing evil. I think yeah, a lot, it of, could. Theod it lot could. of theodicies. It could. In fact, yeah. a lot of theodicies, I think, have that. Yeah, uh, I think it could. Um, but I guess I wanted to suggest that before um, just assuming that, look at the sorts of theodicies that are designed in such a way, or given in such a way, that the goodness of the divine life um, includes defeats of evils in human lives in such a way that the, that the goodness of the divine life is not something that is simply a matter of calculating the best consequences are the best outcomes of the divine choices. So it's not that your interpretation couldn't be compatible with uh, three, but I'm suggesting that some, I think, powerful and subtle theodicies are not, and that they're actually connected with the Williams objection to integrity. Yeah. Okay. So, so then, as as so then it saying, would be an overstatement to say that. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. As long as you, how about threatens instead of threatens? Threatens. Yes. Okay. okay. Fine. Thank you. Resolution. No. Um, so my question has two parts related. Um, and the first, I'm going to try to restate um, Dustin's point because I had a similar, um, mm -hmm. a similar thought, and then the second will follow on that. Um, so here's the restatement. Um, <laughs> You grant later on in the paper that the epistemic version of 2A is sufficient to run an argument from evil, um, and, and then you talk a little bit about that. Uh, but it seems that the epistemic version of 2A is compatible with the me metaphysical version of 2B, 
Um, so in other words, right, uh, it is. The, the, the epistemic yes. version, yeah, yes. okay. Um, but um, if that's the case, then it seems that we can run the argument from evil even if we accept the metaphysical version of 2B. Um, so, uh, so I, oh, I think I that's. Uh, so in other words, you're a per okay, that's an interesting point. So you're imagining a person who actually accepts the metaphysical interpretation to, of 2B, <coughs> but the epistemic version uh, of 2A. Um, and then you're saying, and then and then you want to say what? What's, what's your conclusion? That you could still run the argument from evil just with the epistemic version of 2A. Yes, even you could. if you accept the metaphysical right. version of 2B. Right. So what I was imagining, that's, that's a good point. So what I was imagining is someone um, who says two, and then you say, which do they mean, 2A or 2B? And then you have to simply unpack what they're talking about. So I wasn't actually thinking, I mean, that's a good, good idea. I wasn't actually thinking of a person who has both a metaphysical position interpreting to, and also an epistemic position interpreting to. I wasn't thinking of a person like that. That's interesting. Um, <coughs> right, right. So, so that would mean, uh, yeah, you'd have to look at both interpretations that they have and answer them separately. Okay. Yeah. So the second part of the question then is on this epistemic um, version of 2A. So I'm, um, I'm a little unsure, or it doesn't seem to me that the opponent of the argument from evil necessarily needs something so strong as your um, sta as your statement four, which is uh, yeah. the epistemic version of two A. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't seem to me that the atheist or the proponent of the argument from evil needs to say that in all cases a necessary condition yeah. for reasonably judging right. that some person is good is that one uh, has this prior judgment that they aim to produce good and prevent evil. Like they might grant that, yeah, I could get evidence that somebody's good without having this other evidence about what they do, like testimonial evidence, somebody who knows the person well just tells me this is a good person, for example. Um, it seems that the atheist only needs that in some cases, evidence that somebody uh, does not aim at producing good and preventing evil could be evidence that they're uh, not a good person. Um, and then just argue that those conditions obtain um, in the problem of evil case. So say that Yeah, so we need to have some way to tell the difference, let's say, yeah. Um, so the idea was four is supposed to be a kind of normative rule uh, for how to, you know, adjudicate these conflicts or, uh, among potential set of beliefs. And then you're saying, uh, well, it just depends on the case. Is that right? I mean, um, yeah. Uh, true. That's right. Um, but then it's important to actually look at one, two, and three when we're talking about God. What are your reasons for believing one? What are your reasons for believing two? What are your reasons for believing three? Do you detect a conflict? Why? Well, because I believe some version of two. All right, which version of two? You know, and then kind of take the person through the steps. Um, yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I wasn't uh, suggesting it's going to always end up the same for each person because people have different reasons for each of these beliefs. Uh, only that, I mean, my, my point is, that is the weaker one that it's just not obvious which way you have to go. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Amy? No, they're down here. Okay. Thanks, Linda. Um, so, the way you set it up originally is there's a, you have opposing interpretations of two. So you have two A and two B, mm -hmm. and you see one of them is having to have priority over the other one. Um, and so this came out a little bit in your conversation with Dustin, but it seems like instead, instead of saying one should have priority, it looks like we can have some sort of nice explanatory circle with which we reach it reflect yeah, the right. I mean, this seems to be what we actually do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so why, I, I'm wondering why we tr should try to, why we're trying to fit moral theorists into the box of having one or the other. It does seem like we do both. Like, so this strikes me as something similar to um, how I make sense of terms and modality. So, you know, necessity and possibility, they have different definitions, but they're mutually definable. And so I determine what's necessary and what's possible in part by looking and seeing, well, right. you know, is this, you know, right. is this you know, not necessarily the case? Okay, it's possible. Yeah. And I think similarly what we're doing here, especially in the epistemic case, is trying to reach this sort of reflective equilibrium. So I guess I'm just not seeing the motivation. No, I actually, I, I think that's absolutely okay. right. Okay, so, so if, 
Yeah, I wasn't intending to propose that you have to choose between 2A and 2B. In fact, I think there's a number of interpretations of 2 other than 2A and 2B. Um, but merely using 2A and 2B to highlight two rather extreme views. Sure, sure. And then, but then I wanted to say, I think that typical proponents of the argument for Mebel and many of their attackers do assume 2A. So it's worth pointing out, I mean, if they do, that there are other interpretations of 2, and if you really believe 2A, give me a defense. Well, so I mean, but I think it's important to point out the reflective equilibrium because they're using 2A, but they're not using 2A exclusively. So I mean, as, as Nevin was pointing out, and I agree with this, is you can have a view of 2B, but it, so if I, I can think that somebody is good, but if I get enough evidence, like if they continually keep bringing about bad things, oh, I, yeah, yeah. I will drop that belief. So the um, um, so so yeah. the the argument is not mm -hmm. that they're just you know riding two a home to the exclusion of all these other interpretations. It's the idea that you reach a breaking point, and this seems to be you know one C. This really seems to be what William Rowe is getting at, and, and his argument seems to still go through them because it's not that. He's saying, okay, you have to have this as a definition. He's saying, okay, now, now we've reached a point where it's it's really hard to say that this is a good person. Um, it, you know, what's, what's going on here that could make them still a good person given all of the evidence? That okay, have? that's a good point. Now let me let me see if I can re um, kind of summarize what you just said. Um, you're saying that some proponents of the argument from the law grow are not consistently and you know dogmatically assuming 2A. Mm -hmm. They use 2A as a kind of device to get going. But there are people who are willing to back off and look at alternatives as it arises in the conversation. And as you see it, to really understand Roe, it's not enough to just look at a seven-line argument. You have to look at the full conversation, how it goes back and forth. First, he has 2A, or at least I think he does. Then somebody says whatever they say, and then he, you know. And then it turns out that he thinks <coughs> the conclusion goes through even after having balanced and these different interpretations of two, sometimes using one and sometimes using another. Is that, am I? I think so, yeah. And I think, I think this is a, the, the general way to capture what most people are doing and reasoning about this, just because we've got to figure out what's going on with the metaphysical via epistemic principles. So I think you could go the other way, too, and you would say, you know, if you constantly see somebody doing good things, I'm going to have a harder and harder time thinking that they're like a demon. Um, and so I think, yeah, this, this sort of reasoning, I think, is what other people are doing. Yeah, but, but then I think it's worth pointing out that, that to do that, you have to, you're not, as I say, you're not just giving this quick argument. You have to give a full, a full story with the moves back and forth, and then at the end of your book, you've got your conclusion, but um, you can't, simply pretend that the argument is given just by the, you know, Thule Stanford Encyclopedia article. <laughs> um, that's not it. I mean, the, you know, the argument. Um, yes, fine, thank you. <coughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, uh, I wonder if, um, I could try to give a partial defense of the metaphysical understanding of three. Um, a defense of three? Partial defense. Okay. Because I, I don't know uh, what should be said about the integrity okay. of, of, of Jackson. Um, and, and, and see what you think of it. And I, I don't know if it's well. So. Maybe it's a bit of a But the thought is this, that uh, perhaps we could amend three um, in the following way. Goodness or badness of persons is derivative from the goodness or badness of certain states and affairs. 
which states of affairs? Well, the states of affairs brought about um, uh, by uh, the, uh, the things they're aiming at, and certain states of affairs that have to do with their internal states, states of any country, ah, and so on. Okay. Uh, now, um, okay, that's going to change the Yeah, so that's, that's, that's the general idea. <laughs> and of course, in the case of God, who presumably knows um, what the outcomes will be of actions that he performs, uh, if we take his actions to express his intentions, then it's, it's less clear that we even need some sort of independent criteria um, about God's intentions. But in any case, um, it seems to me that if you adopted that sort of view, uh, that version of three, then we could get the argument uh, from evil off the ground. Um, now let me ask you something here. Uh, let me make sure I got your your amendment goes like this. The goodness or badness of persons is derivative from the goodness or badness of the state's affairs they aim to bring about and prevent, or the states of affairs that consist of their own internal state. Mm. And the state. Like their intentions. Their intentions and, right. and. Okay. So it's a conjunction and it's internal states of affairs, right. such as intentions. Right of the person relevant to their production of the act. Okay. And I'm not sure just right. how you okay. factor Then the, it seems to me the Pauline principles being put right into number three if you do that. Because here, let's see, how can I say this? It seems to me that um, the Pauline principle um, suggests a certain moral psychology where um, acts and intentions, intentions are built, included in the acts, I guess, are separate from the states of affairs a person brings about through their acts. So you don't bring about your act and you don't bring about your intention. You do your act and you have an intention and you bring about something else. That seems to me to be the, the, the picture. I don't know if it's right, but that's the picture that's being used. And so the Pauline principle is saying, if you, you can't say that what uh, makes an act good is determined always, you know, in every case, by the goodness or badness of the states of affairs in that sense, the, the, the states of affairs that you bring about through your intentional acts. So if you say the states of affairs you bring about include your own intentions, well then you blurred the whole distinction that they're trying to make. You know, I'm not saying that the internal states are ones brought about by the action. I'm saying that the they goodness be would be included. Yes, okay, fine. No, I'm just, okay, that's right. I see that. Yeah. In <coughs> that sense, three could be true, but it's it's hiding this distinction that the Pauline principle wants to make. And I mean you could be I don't want to object to this because it, I don't really have any reason to think, you know, it has to be this way. But it's just that the Pauline principle does arise from a certain way of, it, it wants to tell you not to do certain things. And you don't find out that you shouldn't do certain things without a psychology that, that separates your intentional acts from what you bring about from your acts. And so if you say, but the goodness of a person depends upon what they bring about, including how good their intentions, you know, what their intentions are, then that's fine. That might even be true. I don't know. It may be true. But it hides that distinction that, that the Pauline principle wants to illuminate. 
So that's my only answer to that. I'm not actually objecting to your version of three. I'm pointing out that it doesn't, it doesn't do the work that the Pauline, the Pauline principle is trying to get you to see something that you wouldn't see, I think, at least not straightforwardly, with your version of three. Yeah, the question is whether the, the uh, problem of evil can't be gotten off the ground with the modifier. Yeah, then, I'll, then that, okay, maybe I'll think about that one some more. But I mean, my question that Jim wanted me to think about was the Pauline principle, <laughs> and the Pauline principle suggests this certain way of doing it. And then whether if it was redone your way, then what would the, then I'm going to have to say a different thing. Okay, they, I think you should move on. Um, I want to Steve Weiss to have the next question, but would everybody who has a question raise your hand again? I kind of lost track of where we are. Okay. Oh, there were a lot more. Okay, good. The, those are the next two, and then three. Steve, you get the next one. Thanks. Uh, Linda, I, I really loved your talk and uh, found so much value in it, and Marilyn's too last night. Um, but I, I don't think I agree on your last page with the, the particular way you're applying it to uh, the problem of evil uh, there. Um, if we look at uh, 2A, uh, you say the kind of condition intended in 2A can be either metaphysical or epistemic. Um, and I'm, th I'm thinking in the problem of evil, the 2A is a con it states a conditional, and it can be state it states a condition, and it can be stated as a conditional. Um, if a person, let's just say God, if God is a good person, then God aims at such and such. And I'm thinking um, in my dialogues with Roe, he has a he he would assert a he. It's very relevant the way he fills in the tail end, and I'll get to that in a minute. But he would assert that conditional. But I think that it just needs to be a material conditional. It's just a truth functional conditional. And it's one the Christian cannot possibly disagree with, stated that way, when it's finessed the way Roe does. And the way Roe finesses it is to not refer to evil things at the end, but to refer to particular horrors. Um, think of brutal horrors uh, to kind of Could, intensify. I'm sorry, I need to ask you a question. Yeah. Did, you said Roe would accept two or two ways? Two A. A condition for being a good person is oh. that, and then it would be, say, if something is a good person, and I plug okay. in God there, if God is a good person, then God, and now we complete the condition of the way Roe would, then God would only allow a brutal horror, like, like the one Bruce Russell gives, a little four-year-old brutally raped and beaten. Um, and as you say, it's not just the horror of the events that happen to the girl, it's the horror of the actor who does those things. Mm -hmm. So if God is a good God, then God would not allow such a brutal horror unless there were something beyond the brutal horror that he's got in mind for the sake of which he allows it. It's not the brutal horror serves some good, it's his allowing it has to serve something he has in mind. And, and that's, we can take that as a material conditional, if God is a good person, then he'd only allow that if he's got something in mind for the sake of which he allows it. Um, okay, so... And, and, and uh, I think that that's true, and I think it's true roughly for Marilynish reasons, that God has to be a God worthy of my worship and my trust. And if he would allow an evil like that without having something beyond it in mind, well, that would mean he's either indifferent to it, or he actually just gets a kick out of it for its own sake. And such a being, I couldn't trust him. I couldn't, I couldn't worship him. Um, so I don't, um, maybe there's, I don't know what, um, I think Roe can think the same way, but the point is the argument just re requires it be a material conditional. Okay. And I don't see how, and I think he's got us there. Um, okay, so. Um, I'm getting on excited, if sorry. If 2A <laughs> uh, is a material conditional, it says, if someone is a good person, that person aims at producing good states with their Right, but now we finesse the end and the brutal horror way. So okay. we don't even have to use the term evil. Of course, we think that the brutal horror isn't evil, but the point is, okay. it's, it has to be something, there's some purpose beyond okay. it for the sake of which God allows it. Right. Now, my question for you is 
why isn't both of my objections to 2A, why, does, why don't those objections apply just as much to the material conditional version as to the one I have on 2A? <coughs> In other words, why wouldn't 2A as a material conditional why wouldn't an objection to 2A as a material conditional be the Pauling principle? And why wouldn't another objection to 2A as a material conditional be the integrity objection where I'm filling it out with an account that say something like Maryland's, where the goodness of the divine life is not a matter of producing an outcome where the goods outweigh the evils, but is a matter of having a divine life with an organic structure in which evils are defeated by Christ, and the goodness of which the whole life is not an outcome of individual choices. That is, it isn't the, you know, an end state of affairs. Right. Well, I would think if it's an objection <coughs> to, to a construed as a material conditional, then of course you think the conditional is false. The only way it can be false is if you think the antecedent is true and the, and the, and the consequent is false. That is, you have to say God is a good person, Yes. But he sometimes does allow brutal horrors yes. with no purpose in mind beyond those brutal horrors. Now, well, the story no, no, you're no, giving that's me not says... What the, that's not what 2A says. I mean, it says, it says something about the aim of a good being. Could there be a no, case well, of... No, 2A prime. So I'm finessing 2A prime, so it's Rose 2A, the brutal horror version of, of, of 2A. So if God, if God is a good person... He would only allow a brutal horror like that if there were some purpose served by his allowing it. Okay, and what Roe means by some purpose served is not Marilyn's idea, I take it, but is um, the, the purpose has to be a good that outweighs the evil. Is that right? <coughs> it has to be a good... Well, I don't want to be technical about that ways. It has to be a good, sufficiently good that it's it makes it worthwhile to him to for the evil to be allowed. And then I would say your story does. Your story says the the inner story of God's life in some way requires him painfully to allow that horror. And it's a, an important enough good so that he does allow it. He doesn't like to, but he does. And so I'd say you're not rejecting 2A construed as a material conditional. You're saying there is a good, it's a good uh, It's a good uh, Roe hasn't considered. Maybe he's thinking of goods too narrowly. Okay, so... Um, I mean, we need to talk carefully about what his 2A prime is, but if he, if you think he's willing to accept as a reason why a good being would aim to produce or not to eliminate evils. Something like the organic narrative account, mm -hmm. if he would accept that, well then that's not the thesis I'm objecting to. In which case, then the issue would be the particular issue of what counts as such a good. I mean, give me the story, right, right. and then, you know, here's Marilyn's story, here's Eleanor's right, story. Right. And then they debate about the story. But that sounds to me as if you're saying, Roe is not accepting 2A as I'm interpreting it. He's a willing to broaden it enough to permit cases of good, uh, I mean, permit, permit narratives such as the Christological narrative Marilyn gives. Right, I don't so, I mean, argue, obviously, if he does that, yeah, I, we're I not guess, arguing. Right, I want to compare 2A and 2' prime in a conversation, but I don't want to hog this one. I, I'm i not sure, construed as a material conditional, why um, we'd agree the brutal horror is a really awful thing and God doesn't like it, so it's an evil in that sense. We'd agree to that as Christians. We'd agree um, it's not having uh, organic life of the sort he wants. It's kind of a dynamic, long state of affairs, but isn't that a good state of affairs? 
Well, then I, I mean, I don't want to get into this whole thing about how Bernard Williams gives his objection, but I mean, he's, the, the Williams integrity objection is an objection to a certain form of practical reasoning or a certain rule of practical reasoning where you're supposed to um, act in such a way that you bring about the best consequences as impersonally calculated, <coughs> where consequences are the outcome of whatever you do, right? And that's the version he's objecting to. And I was suggesting that many proponents of the argument from evil are using a thesis that's very close to that, that, that view of practical reason. Okay, but you and that his integrity objection okay. actually it does work against that. Okay, so you thing. mean good states of affairs in two ways, so that it, it doesn't include the good thing you're thinking of, That's which right. is okay. Yeah. Um, so, okay, well that that gets us going. So I mean, if but, some utilitarian said, "Oh, I I agree with Williams. He's absolutely right. Integrity, <laughs> yeah, right." So I'm going to change my principle of utility, and it's going to include. You know, the goodness of a life taken as a whole, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to say, fine, well, then I guess we're not arguing with each other. Okay, good. Yeah. But we're not either. <laughs> okay, we got six minutes and three people on the queue. Let's do as, as good a job as we can. Yep. So I want to talk to you about what you say in the possibilities one and two at the bottom of page two. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a strong reading of them and a weaker reading of them. And here's the strong reading of one. They're intrinsically good or evil acts. And the moral properties of persons derived solely from the moral properties of acts as follows. And I think you have a good reason to reject that when it's read with the word solely introduced after derived, derived solely from the prop moral properties of right, acts. Right, right, right. So I, I agree with you that, that that I think is too strong. And I like your examples. But I think similarly, if you read too strongly, the moral properties of acts derived solely from the features of persons as follows is also false. And so if, those, if you take the weaker version of each, each of those possibilities, mm -hmm. it allows that there are some kinds of things that a good person would not allow. And right. that's what I think Steve is saying. That's what I think about you know, the mm -hmm. first premise in the problem of evil. is just, I don't really want to, I want to get agreement with the theist and me about the first moral premises said, if God exists, if this good person exists, he wouldn't allow, let's say, unnecessary horrors. Or I think maybe Peter has an objection, so I add a little tweak and say, excessive unnecessary horrors. And I want to get a principle that the theists and I agree on. So there's no argument about the moral pre premise. And then the next premise says, but there are unnecessary horrors or something like that, you know. And then there are two moves you can make there. Either you try skeptical theism and try to say either we're not in a position to judge or maybe you bring in integrity to say, well, there's reason to think it's false. Or you attack the second premise in, in that version of the argument from evil. Or you go, which I think is the way it sounds like Maryland's approach goes, it's not undercutting the argument, it's overriding it. You go modus ponens. You know, if God exists, no unnecessary horrors, God exists no unnecessary horrors despite appearances. So that's okay. I mean, it's, it's a big argument. Maybe you can do overriding this and go modus ponens. I go modus tollens. And in modus tollens, you can try to undercut. You can try to undercut the second premise that says there are unnecessary horrors. Because whatever that, that consequent is, as Steve says, the second premise is going to say, but not that. And that's the only options you have, I think, and, and then the question is whether skeptical theism or some kind of theodicy or something like that is sufficient to undercut the uh, second premise. And it's all epistemology after that. Okay. Um, I understood the beginning part of your remarks, but I'm not sure um, if I understood how that point fed into the rest of your remarks. So okay. I'm going to yeah. do my best to answer, starting with the beginning of your remarks. Um, you were talking about um, the uh, weaker versions of these two the possibilities. The weaker versions of possibility one and possibility two, where I'm actually endorsing the weaker versions, where the weaker version says uh, possibility one, uh, or well, it's actually both of them. The moral properties of a person does not 
derive completely or does not wholly derive. Um, but sometimes it does. From yes, sometimes it does. Right, sometimes it does. So the um, issue, one issue that we have been talking about in this conference, um, uh, that was is suggested by the Pauline principle, is the issue of whether there's intrinsically evil acts, and presumably there are not a lot of these acts. So they, for the most part. <coughs> The adherent of the Pauline principle will agree that people aim to produce good and prevent evil. And they to produce good consequences, sure, fine. You know, you do that all the all the time. But there are certain acts which one must never perform because they're intrinsically evil. So my quite my point then is that means, and if the goodness of a person depends upon the goodness of their acts. That means that the goodness of the person depends, at least in part, on the fact that they don't do intrinsically evil acts. It doesn't derive wholly from, completely from, the moral properties of the acts they aim to bring about. And that, that can make a difference in the problem of evil in this way, because it looks like you can't hold God to account for making every choice in such a way that God is aiming to produce the best outcome. That would be, because there could be acts that God can't do, or that are ruled out or something like that. I don't know. I mean, that option, I haven't figured out how it would work yeah. in the problem of evil. But I think that's the question that we're, that's being raised by the Pauline principle. But, but the, the, so the, the goodness the of God is, couldn't derive simply or totally yeah, from the But the point goodness. is Steve's point that namely, okay, we can grant that the goodness of an act isn't solely a function of the goodness even of the states of affair, or the goodness of a person isn't solely a function of his aiming at the certain states of affairs, but, or allowing them, but sometimes it is, and that's the claim here, that in particular a good person couldn't allow unnecessary horrors. Of course you're right, I'm just going to grant you that yeah, you're right, yeah. that it's not solely a function of the states of affairs or the acts that they aim at or allow, intentionally allow to happen, but sometimes it is, and sometimes here it, it is. is yeah. This case it is. Linda, you get the last word, we're okay. bring it to an end. So, so it might be like, I mean, the, the, uh, take the Jim and the Indians case. This isn't even an extreme horror, it's only 20 people, it's not millions, but um, um, you know how, how Williams argues, Jim has to decide whether to kill one Indian to prevent Pedro from killing 20, right? And um, I mean, Williams actually thinks, he kind of slips this in because he doesn't think it's very important for the point, but he actually thinks Jim should shoot the Indian, right? He should prevent the horror of 20 Indians being slaughtered by Pedro. So it isn't that there, even if there are acts you shouldn't do, um, that are, he doesn't say intrinsically evil, but the person who, who endorses the Pauline principle would say, you know, there's certain acts you shouldn't do. You shouldn't kill an innocent person, even to save 20. But then someone will say, but wait a minute. Sometimes there's exceptions to the Pauline principle. There's exceptions to it if the outcome is horrible enough. You should do what Williams thinks you should do. Sometimes you just have to sacrifice your own integrity just because the outcome's so bad. And I think, I mean, I, I haven't said that isn't true. I mean, that may be right. But depends on, I guess, how you interpret that Pauline principle, whether you think it has exceptions. So maybe the fact that if you think, maybe it really matters if you think it's an absolute principle. I guess it does. Yeah. Oh, uh, join me in thanking Linda for a splendid. <laughs>